hear me? Yes. Good. Um, I'm going to talk to you about ego, empathy, and the making of spent, or in shorthand, this game is rigged. I work as a creative director at an advertising agency. We're a national agency, which means we work with a lot of big brands, but the client that's closest to my heart is a homeless shelter and emergency services organization in Durham called Urban Ministries of Durham. I like to call it using my powers for good. We'd worked with them for several years doing more traditional work, television commercials, print ads, out of home boards, and it wasn't working. We weren't getting people to move to action the way we wanted them to, and we realized this was happening because we were using the same message that everybody else who talks about poverty uses, and that's appealing to two emotional states, pity and guilt. The message generally when people are talking about poverty and trying to move people to change is this. They have so little. You have so much. You should share, which doesn't, it, it doesn't work. People feel, oh, that's bad, too bad. Um, we realized we had to do something different. We realized that the problem was, was there was a big gap between us and them. And in order to really create true empathy, we had to find a way to narrow the gap. And in trying to do that, it led us to a really fundamental question. And that's, why are people poor? And more specifically, why do people who aren't poor think people are poor? And really, whether we like it or not, throughout history, there's been an underlying assumption about why people are poor, and it's this. Lazy people are soon poor, hard workers get rich. And this is from the book of Proverbs, so it goes back just a little while. Um, I'd like to say that this is just an ancient belief that has no relevance in this day and age, but the truth is, as you'll see from modern American Proverbs, it still exists. Enter the meme. The meme, okay. I vote Republican because I'm sick of my tax dollars being funneled to lazy poor people. Or, nonpartisan group right here. Um, or, let me go lay out at the pool at my Section 8 apartment complex while all you suckers pay your taxes and work your asses off. So, poor people are lazy. But it's not just that they're lazy. They also make really bad decisions. Oh, you spent your welfare check on the new iPhone and now you're broke? Better ask Siri where you can get a job like the rest of us. Or my personal favorite one from Fox News, it's because they spend their money on terrible luxuries like refrigerators. Um, yeah, so what this all boils down to, all of these memes, all of these narratives boils down to this. What if I told you poor people make bad life choices? Now, the reason this is dangerous, beyond the fact that it's a sweeping generalization and those are always dangerous, is that it allows us to assume the opposite. Well, I'm not poor, and therefore it must be because I make good decisions, and because I make good decisions, I will never end up poor. Dangerous game. Because the truth is, you can't know what it's like to be poor unless you've been there. You can't know the challenges you'll face, you can't know the context that you'll live in, you can't know the rules you have to play by, and you can't know the decisions that you've made. And I know, because I did live it. This is my childhood home. A 19-foot trailer with no electricity, no running water. I lived it, and I can tell you it's hard. It's exhausting. It's stressful. It's scary. It's demeaning. I remember my mom saying that it felt like no matter what we did, one good thing would happen, and as soon as a good thing happened, something bad would happen to knock you back the step you just thought you were taking forward. But the funny thing is, is even though this was my life, even though I lived it, now that I have a steady job and a good income and an education, it feels so far away to me. It's so hard to remember what an actual day in my life felt like. It feels like a story that happened to somebody else, and I lived it. So the challenge that we had is if I lived it and I can barely remember what it felt like, how do we bring that real understanding to people who've never been poor at all? And the way we did it was we made a game. A game about poverty. Uh, you could imagine the look on the client's face when we said we want to make a game about your clients and their lives. Um, and what you'll notice is from the first frame of spent, it's very different than any other message about poverty that I had ever seen. Urban Ministries of Durham serves over 6,000 people every year, but you'd never need help, right? Prove it, and the button is accept the challenge. And the thing about this, it's not an appeal to your heart. It's not speaking to your Samaritan nature. It's a challenge. It's a challenge directly to your ego, to that part of you that says that would never happen to me. The other thing you'll notice as I take you through some examples of spent is there are no visuals. 
There are no videos. There are very few voices. And the reason for this is we didn't want it to be play a game where you pretend to be a poor person for 30 days. We wanted it to be play this game, take your own beliefs, your own experiences, your own priorities, and apply them to these situations and see how you would do. And that was really important. It also didn't hurt that that made it a lot cheaper to produce. Um, so one of the challenges we had was, how do you get from somebody living a comfortable middle class life all the way to being on the edge? That's a big gap. And in order to get into this game, we had to bridge it really quickly. So we did it by invoking the boogeyman that I don't care how much money you make, if you earn an income and work for a living, there's a fear that you always have, which is that what happens if you lose your job and you can't get another one? And so that's where we start. So that's really the premise of spent, not a hard one to believe. You lost your job, can't find another one, blew through your savings, your house got foreclosed on, your marriage couldn't handle it, and you've got $1,000 left in the bank. Can you survive for 30, month, 30 days? And really what we do is each day you get a new challenge faced by somebody in poverty, taken from the experiences that I had growing up and also from the experiences of the people who Urban Ministries of Durham serve. So what I'm gonna do for the rest of our time is just take you through some of the challenges and talk to you about the choices we made and why we chose the challenges that we did. Uh, the first thing that everybody who plays the game faces is you have to get a job. Because that's what everyone says, right? If you think about people who have never been poor, they're like, I would do whatever I had to do. I would get a job at McDonald's. Like, that's what everybody says. I'd get a job at Taco Bell. OK, fine. Go get a job at Taco Bell. Um, and that's what you do. You can work in a warehouse. You can work at a restaurant. Or if you have typing skills, you can get a job as an office temp. Um, the other thing I want to point out here is whenever possible, we used actual information and actual numbers because we wanted it to be as real as we could. So we pulled these job listings directly from listings on Craigslist, and we used actual North Carolina wage data to come up with the pay. Um, that's an important thing. Another thing that we did with a lot of challenges and spent was to take, um, create these really intensely personal scenarios to give life to these macro statistics to help you find empathy when maybe they would just go over your head as a number. So for example, you might get a challenge in the game like this. Your credit card kept you afloat while you were trying to hold on to your home. But even though the house is gone, the balance isn't. That is not what I wanted to say here. What I wanted to say here is that it gets you right into the mindset of doing that like endless having to do the math, having to figure out what can you put off, what's your priority, what do you have to do. So in this case, it'd be great to pay it all off, but I know it's hard to see, but you've got a balance of over $7,000 and you have not even 500 bucks in the bank. You can't pay it off. And while most of us know that just ignoring isn't a good idea, we're gonna go ahead and pay the minimum, except if you continue to pay only the minimum, it's going to take you 17 years to pay off that credit card bill, and that's only if you don't put another penny on it. So letting people know that in this country, once you get into a hole, even if it's a hole that you didn't cause yourself, it becomes really hard to get out of it. And then we do challenges that bring to life macro statistics, like this one. <laughs> uh, the flu has been going around, and it just hit your house. Your child's running a fever and has the chills, but you're supposed to be at work. What do you want to do? Well. Your kid's sick. What parent in the world wants to send a sick kid to school? Every parent wants to stay home with their kid, right? But the truth is, if you look up here on the left, you can see, I know it's hard to see here, but there's a column that says job strikes. If you miss three days of work in this game, you lose your job. You've already missed one. What are you going to do? You're going to send your kid to school sick. And you're going to have a little more empathy when you get this note that says, like you, 39% of working families have had to send a child to school knowing they were sick. And maybe next time a sick kid shows up in your kid's class, you won't be all judgy about it, right? Um, another thing we wanted to address is this assumption that people who reach out to the government from help or reach out to a place like Urban Ministries of Durham do it because it's the easy way out. The truth is, is when people fall on hard times, the first thing they do is they turn to their friends, they turn to their family. They sleep on couches. They borrow money. They impinge on acquaintances. But the truth is that goodwill runs out really quick. People go to Urban Ministries of Durham when they have nowhere else to go. And we thought to ourselves, how can we really bring that to light? And we did it with challenges like this. Two bills are due today. What do you want to do? You can pay one. You can pay the other. You can pay them both. Or you can ask a friend for money. And these two little icons here are one of the most important things in all of spent. Because what happens is you click one of those in either Facebook or Twitter, your choice. It brings up an auto-populated message that says, 
I can't pay all my bills this month. Can I borrow some money from you? And that goes to all of your friends and followers on the social network. And people had a really hard time with this. We got tons of messages that says, I know it's a game. I know it's not real. But I still ran out of money rather than posting something asking my friends for help. But people did share, <laughs> lots of them. Um, and one of the great things about it is not only was this a way to raise their awareness of the game, it also was the primary mechanism by which this game spread. We didn't have any paid media. We didn't have any paid promotion. The game spread just by people playing the game, asking their friends for help, and getting them to play too. But really, the heart and soul of Spent, the challenges that make it as powerful as it is, are challenges where there is no good answer. The difference between having a good answer and not having a good answer hinges only on how much money is in your bank account. For example, you're driving with your kid in the back seat when your car slips on a slick stretch of road and slides into a parked car, causing a big dent in the bumper and a broken tail light. You hit a car, your kid's in the back. Do you leave a note knowing that you're going to have to pay almost $600 in damage, or do you drive away? All of us, I think, would like to believe that we'd use this as a teaching opportunity for our child, to show them the difference between right and wrong, the importance of taking responsibility for your actions, right? That choice becomes a lot more complicated when you've only got $844 in the bank and doing the right thing is going to take most of that money. Or, your family pet is sick and won't get better without treatment. What do you want to do? Pay $400 to get your uh, pet treated at the vet? Pay 50 bucks to get it put to sleep or let your pet suffer. This challenge, more than any challenge in the game, is the one where people chose to spend the money, chose to run out of money, chose to lose the game. This one. And I think it brings to light a really important fact, and that's most people who play spent play it twice. The first time they play it, they play it like the person they want to believe they are. They make the choices that they like to think that they would make, and they run out of money. They run out on day 12. They run out on day 14. And then they play the game again. And they play it this time with survival in mind. And they make it through the end because they realize that they can't afford in this world to be the person they wanted to be. But you do eventually make it if you played enough and you make the choices. But you make it having broken promises to your children, borrowed money you couldn't pay back, ignored bills you really should have paid, put off health conditions you should treat, and even if you do make it, with $200 at the end, guess what? Rent's due tomorrow. And that feeling of, oh my God, I just went through this for a month and I have to do it all over again? If any one person who's never been poor again can understand that feeling, that's what Spent was made for. So I want to talk to you a little bit about the results. Spent's been played five and a half million times. It's been played by all sorts of people, and it's been paid by people who got really, really, really pissed off. People said things like, this game is bullshit. This game is a bunch of liberal propaganda. Or my favorite, and the quote from which my title was taken, this game is rigged. Yes, because it is, right? That's the whole point. Yeah, it worked. Um, but what I love is people go on forums and say that, and invariably, almost every time, somebody else would come onto that forum and say, no, you guys. This is how it feels. This is what it's like. I lived it, and this is my life. And so the conversations that Spent started are as powerful as the game itself. Spent's been played in 227 countries. We actually got a donation of $5 from someone who lives in sub-Saharan Africa because they said they were so stunned to realize that people who live in the United States of America face challenges like this. And finally, Spence has been um, the subject of 45 academic articles. My very favorite one is somebody actually did their dissertation on spent, and they found that when high schoolers played spent, they had significantly more empathy for people struggling with poverty, both immediately after playing spent and two weeks after playing spent. And I have to tell you that knowing that something that I made is changing the way young people think about people like I was when I grew up is by far the highlight of my life. And what I learned in the process, surprisingly, is that sometimes speaking to the ego can be an unexpected path to the heart. Thank you.